Okay, I think we're about ready to get started. So my name is David Lazell. I'm the Energy Systems Architect with the Transition Accelerator. Uh, I've been with the Transition Accelerator since it started in, in 2019, and we're a national nonprofit charity that is working to try to accelerate the transition to a net zero economy. I'm coming to you from Calgary, Alberta today, the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 in southern Alberta, and Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta in Districts 5 and 6. But the Transition Accelerator is a Canadian organization. We have staff all across the many different provinces, so we acknowledge the traditional territories of the Indigenous peoples on all of the land on which we work and live. We recognize and express and respect the, the ongoing relationship that Indigenous peoples have to their land, and we commit to the ongoing process of reconciliation. Global, climate, global greenhouse gas emissions are currently about 50 billion tons of CO2 equivalents per year, where about three quarters of the emissions are associated with the production and use of energy. For the Canadians in the audience, we are only about half of 1% of the world's population, but we're responsible for 1.5% of global emissions. So that means that Canadians generate about three times the average global greenhouse gas emissions per capita. Clearly, to address climate change, we need to transform our energy, agricultural, and industrial systems. The climate change science is clear. To avoid the, avoid the most severe impacts of climate change, net zero greenhouse gas emissions must be achieved by mid-century. The primary focus needs to be on dramatically reducing the emissions of methane, nitrous oxide, and fossil fuel-derived CO2 to the atmosphere. Even if countries meet their commissions, uh, commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, there will still be some residual greenhouse gas emissions that must be removed. And we need... And we know that stabilization of global climate is likely to require implementing carbon removal technologies even after we meet net zero to make us negative emission uh, into the future. The technologies can to, to achieve these um, carbon removals from the atmosphere can be grouped into three, if you like, bins. First ones is building carbon stocks in forest, in agricultural soils, in wetlands, or in the ocean. The second is, is to couple biomass energy extraction with carbon capture and storage. It's often called BECCS, B-E-C-C-S. And this is really converting sustainably growing biomass to fuel and, or electricity while capturing and permanently storing the CO2 byproduct in geological formations. And the third technology is direct air capture. This uses specialized chemicals or materials to bind atmospheric CO2 from ambient air, and then either put it underground for permanent storage or do something useful with it. Now, in today's panel discussion, we are going to be focusing on this third carbon removal technology, the direct air capture. We are pleased to have three DAC experts on the panel today, and if I ask them to put their cameras on. Um, Sylvan Ashleman is the manager and direct air carbon lead air capture lead for the Carbon Removal Initiative at the Rocky Mountain Institute, the RMI. It's a well-known independent nonprofit organization that's working to accelerate the clean energy transition. Well, RMI's headquarters are in Colorado. Sylvan called Switzerland home, and I think he said he was in Barcelona today. So he moves around Europe for sure. Donald Adu is uh, our second uh, speaker today, and he's the Senior Manager for Strategic Partnerships of Climeworks. It's a Swiss-based company doing direct air capture and storage of CO2. He comes to us today from, uh, from actually New York, but he's in North Carolina. Emily Gruber is an Associate Professor of Sustainable Energy Pol Policy at the University of Notre Dame or Notre Dame, uh, in, uh, in Indiana, Notre Dame, Indiana. She's a civil engineer and environmental sociologist who studies how we can make better decisions about large infrastructure systems, particularly related to, related to justice-centering decarbonization of the U.S. energy system. Now, I'd like to begin by asking each of the panelists to take a few minutes to describe the role that direct air capture can play or should play in the transition to net zero emissions. What is good about direct air capture? 
do you have any concerns about the technology and how it could be used? And while the panelists are given their response, and as we go through some question periods and discussion, I'd encourage the audience to think up some good questions for the panelists and to put them in the Q&A box, the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I will try to get to these questions during the panel discussion afterwards. Uh, Sylvana, I'd like to ask you to start with your comments, please. Yeah, thank you. So, so three questions. Um, what is the role that that could play? Um, what is good about it? What are my concerns? I'm just going to answer the three questions in the order that came in. I think to adequately describe the role direct air capture could play within the larger energy um, transition, I first need to define and outline what I think C the role of CDR is going to be because direct air capture essentially is a subset of, um, of CDR. I think the most important thing to say up front is that um, CDR is not going to be an insurance policy in, in case sustained decarbonization and emission reductions fail. Um, instead, it's, it's a complementary tool that only can be successful if we, if we achieve sustained emission reductions. I know for some folks on this call, it's still early or quite early in the morning or at noontime, but I still like to think of that in terms of a, of, um, of a drinking metaphor. So if someone gets um, brought to a hospital because he dr drank so much alcohol that he needs to go to an hospital, um, they usually don't empty your stomach if you refuse to um, give up drinking while being in the hospital and don't, you, don't wanna give away the bottle that you have been drinking off. So I think that's kind of like the same way it works for emission reductions and CDR. CDR, which is basically pumping our, out the stomach, kind of like removing historic em emissions can only work if you first gave up drinking, which is basically emitting further. So now a little bit more in detail, I think CDR can have two major roles. One is just um, removing the historical emissions that we've put up in the atmosphere since the industrial um, um, revolution. And, and second, basically help to um, um, counteract hard to abate sectors that might not be um, econo uh, economical to, to decarbonize. Now, within that, direct air capture is going to be a part of a solution portfolio. Um, I think I, IPC estimates that about 2 to 20 gigatons of carbon dioxide need to be removed um, from the atmosphere by 250 on a yearly basis. That's basically too much to achieve it with one technology alone. Therefore, direct air capture has to be um, a subset of a, of a so solution portfolio. portfolio. Our, my th we think that um, till two, 2050, direct air capture has the potential to scale maybe to about the gigaton removal by a year and more after that. Um, now, what, what I like about direct air capture or what I think it's, it's good about direct air capture is basically that we know that it works. Um, we know we can remove um, um, CO2 from the atmosphere using um, um, direct air capture, but what concerns me is that it's just too expensive right now. And I think the second major concern that I have is that the technology could be ad abused. Um, I think the, the whole the moral hazard um, argument is well known that basically um, being able to um, remove their, um, CO2 from the atmosphere using the um, using um, direct air capture could be an excuse for heavy emitters to keep emitting. Um, I think I don't want to go um, deep into the, um, the topic here of what needs to happen that it cannot be at use, but I just want to um, say two points um, um, in context of mitigation deterrence more broadly. Right? For people that are not familiar with the term mitigation deterrence, it's just basically making sure that if you scale CDR, you're also making sure that you don't deter emissions reductions. And I think um, Carbon Gap and NGO in Europe has just uh, published a wonderful report on all the things that could do. I would just like to mention two things. Um, first, the like for like principle, making sure that when corporates in their net zero um, targets want to claim that, they're, that um, they get to net zero, you basically make sure they remove um, all emissions that stems from fossil fuels with permanent CDR solutions. Um, the, the second thing that I would like to flag is just um, these corporates should also make sure um, 
that they invest in CDR now and not, not just in 2050, because um, some of the, the, the net zero plans that we're seeing, they basically assume um, CDR or direct air capture is going to be available at scale by 2050. Um, by 2050 but um, it will need ha um, to have time to scale to, to the degree that is needed to about one gigaton by 2050. So um, your net zero plan should al already include um, investments in CDR now and not just in 2050. Thanks, Lillian. Thanks. Go ahead, Donald. No, <laughs> thanks, David. No, appreciate it. I appreciate the, you know, you having this topic and, and giving us a chance to, to discuss this. I, I find it really exciting. And um, I'm, I'm new to the direct air capture space, uh, really joined Climeworks a, a little over a year ago. And uh, I spent the 10 years prior in, in government and uh, advising around policy. And so being in this uh, kind of cutting edge technology is, is very, very exciting. I really see direct air capture as a, as a fundamental technology in terms of us addressing climate. Um, we, I, I, I think the framework uh, of needing to kind of do everything at once is really important because we are uh, we are behind the eight ball. Uh, David, you mentioned at the start, you know, we're at about 50 uh, gigatons of CO2, CO2 equivalents uh, emitted globally every year. That is a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide that we are continuing to put into the atmosphere. If we stop that tomorrow, if we could flip a switch and go to zero emissions tomorrow, we're still at about 420 parts per million in the atmosphere of CO2. That is an unstable planet. That's an unlivable world. We, we have to get below 350 parts per million by the scientific consensus. So direct air capture really has the ability to, to, to be fundamental, a fundamental technology in getting us there. And that's why, that's the value I see in this technology and why we need to scale it. I also see the value in it in terms of the the, the land use, right? Uh, we we need very very little land in order to to capture a very large amount of carbon uh, using direct air capture, and uh, and as we see uh, the the need for land use to to shift and change uh, throughout the twenty first century, I think that low car that low land footprint is is really an asset in terms of this technology. Uh, I can, uh, and then I'll mention one more thing about the what I what I like about direct air capture is its measurability. There's no ambiguity. We know exactly how much CO2 we're capturing out of the air and how much we're storing uh, directly underground. So, uh, so it really takes out when we think about MRV, the measurability, reportability, verification. Uh, that is really where direct air capture shines. Uh, we can say we can say with almost complete certainty uh, how much is being removed. And I think that that's a, and that is gonna be fundamental as we start thinking about policies and regulation that move companies and, and governments toward uh, their net zero goals and, and ultimately getting that CO2 out of the air. Uh, we do need to get to a net negative, right? Well, it's like net zero. We talk a lot about net zero. We need to get to net zero, but uh, you know, net zero is really just the start. Uh, we, we've got to get to net negative. Uh, and and quickly as quickly as we can. Uh, I'd agree with a, a Sylvan that uh, a gigaton of capture by 2050 is is realistic. That is Climeworks's goal. Uh, we are we are currently the the largest direct air capture company in the world, uh, and we currently capture a uh, 4,000 tons a year. That's our nominal capacity. Our capacity is going to go up to 40,000 tons next year. Now, if we think about that scale, right? And it's like 40,000 tons compared to a gigaton. That's a pretty big gap. And so uh, the the ability for us to scale and scale quickly is is essential. Uh, and so I I would reiterate that you know when we think about the the tension between reduction and removal, it really has to be done simultaneously uh, because this this will have to scale. Uh, in terms of concerns, uh, I think uh, I I think one of the bigger concerns is cost. Uh, we we are expensive. Uh, we are the most expensive way to get CO two out of the air. And the way that I think about this is, uh, you know, to, to not emit CO2 to begin with, that's, that's the ounce of prevention, and we're the pound of cure. Uh, and uh, that's, that's, how, that's, that's where we're at. And so the, the faster we can scale, the, the cheaper it will get. Um, our, uh, and so that's, that's really what we're thinking about uh, from, from an industry standpoint. Uh, of course, you know, we gain economies of scale, all these things make, uh, we'll, we'll be able to drive that cost down. And we'll get into the, the details of the cost a little bit later. But so that that is that is a concern, uh, but when we think about the cost of climate, uh, I mean, in in the United States, uh, we've experienced over 150 billion dollars in disaster costs just this year. 
Um, and uh, you know, over the last several years, it's 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 topped over a hundred billion dollars every year uh, for the last uh, I believe fifteen years. So the 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 costs are real, and uh, and it's uh, and it's it's we've really come to the point where it's time to. Uh, actually pay the the cost of this pollutant that we have been emitting basically consequence free uh since the beginning of the industrial revolution great thank you very much uh thanks for that uh, emily please yeah absolutely so i have the pleasure of coming after a couple of other talks that i think uh, explain a lot of what's going on with cdr but to kind of add in my position on CDR and direct air capture, I think one of the things that we all have been talking about and I think kind of recognize is that there is a need for negative emissions if we're going to reach net zero. Just like mathematically, if you have positive emissions, you also need negative emissions or you can just go to zero emissions. But there are a number of types of things that are pretty widely recognized as not possible to abate and still kind of continue the standard of living we have for the population that we have. So thinking about things like agricultural emissions, they can be brought down, but there are some that probably are going to persist. Similarly, if we start talking about, uh, like Don was saying, trying to get below this 420 parts per million and probably much higher that we're going to end up eventually, you need negative emissions if you're going to get to net negative. And so within that context of thinking, you know, the amount of climate change that we've already caused, it is relatively clear that we are going to need some carbon dioxide removal. Direct air capture is one of the technologies that is capable of delivering carbon dioxide removal. And here, maybe I'll introduce a frame that I use quite frequently, which is that CDR, carbon dioxide removal, is a function. It's not a technology, this type of thing. Direct air capture is a technology that is capable of delivering carbon dioxide removal, but not necessarily. So if you have direct air capture that is being powered by emissions intensive uh, inputs, so whether that's natural gas or uh, fossil based electricity or something like that, it is not actually on net going to be taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. Similarly, you can use direct air capture without coupling that capture to a storage that results in permanent sequestration of CO2 out of the atmosphere. So if you use direct air capture to make jet fuel or something along those lines, that may allow you to avoid some emissions, but it's not fundamentally a removal because you're going to be releasing the CO2 again. So direct air capture is capable of delivering carbon dioxide removal when coupled with permanent storage. And I think a lot of the questions that we see moving forward about it are really what that capability looks like. I think Don pointed out it's it's true that one of the big advantages of direct air capture relative to a lot of other carbon dioxide removal or negative emissions approaches is that you can measure how much CO2 you have captured really, really precisely. That said, it's still not super clear how good we are at figuring out what all of the upstream emissions might look like and what some of the releases post capture might be. So we are fairly confident that the permanence when you take CO2 out of the atmosphere with direct air capture, convert that to fluids and put it underground, that's something where we can tell pretty much precisely how much CO2 is actually fluxing out of the atmosphere into a storage degree, but it's still a little hard to figure out what the net emissions are. And this is one of, I think, the bigger challenges associated with direct air capture. I think the other big thing that I'll raise before we get into our longer discussion is that Direct air capture, like other CDR capable approaches, is resource limited. In this case, a lot of that is because it's very energy intensive, and that's part of the reason why it's expensive. But most CDR approaches are resource limited in some way, whether that's land or place to put the CO2 or whatever. We do see a lot of resource limitation. And so part of the big conversation about CDR in general and direct air capture specifically is what are we actually willing to use it for and who decides? I think both of the other panelists have already talked about this notion that there is a lot of scaling to do, but even the idea of getting to a gigaton, some of the things that people are talking about using CDR to offset, so talking about like net zero oil or something like that, would put us in much, much, much different scenarios in terms of how much CDR we're actually talking about than the ones that are really focused on these you know, you really can't get rid of these emissions, kind of the last few nitrous oxide emissions from using very precise fertilizer in agricultural contexts or whatever. And so thinking a lot about that resource limitation and how we actually have some sort of societally beneficial method of deciding how you allocate it, 
particularly because given the resource limitation, using more CDR for offsetting also restricts your ability to use it to correct legacy emissions and actually start to draw those concentrations down. I think it's probably one of the biggest challenges we have. So my spicy take is I don't think that markets can do this. And I think that we are about to make a really big mistake if we move into a kind of unconstrained for-profit market-driven setting with CDR, but there's a lot of conversations to be had about this. So looking forward to the rest of the panel. Wow, that's very interesting. Thank you, all three of you. Some very useful and interesting comments. Maybe let's let's follow up, Emily, with some of the things that you were talking about, just about some of the costs. I mean, what is what is the electricity cost? I mean, this is a this is a pretty uh, uh, electricity intensive process. So, what is the uh, are the electricity requirements? Maybe in sort of megawatt hours or whatever per ton of CO two, if that's what we often talk about for electricity in Canada. Uh, and what impact does it have on the cost uh, per ton of, you know, for U.S. dollars say, per metric ton of CO2 that is uh, removed from the atmosphere and dealt with? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think this is one of those places where there's a lot of ambiguity about where this is actually going to shake out. It's also the case that a lot of direct air capture processes use both heat and electricity. So these numbers kind of assume you're using electricity for all of it because that allows you to use cleaner resources rather than using natural gas directly, for example. But I think a lot of the sort of expert assessments of where we're going to end up in terms of energy intensity, and maybe Don can correct me on this, tend to come out around a little more than two megawatt hours a ton. Um, that's the thing that gets used very frequently in modeling contexts. And just to put some numbers behind that further, if you assume that you have access to electricity at about $30 a ton, which is pretty cheap, that's what we would tend to see as kind of wholesale prices in the United States. You might see some solar and wind projects coming in a little under that, but generally that's kind of the very bottom cheapness of electricity that you're talking about. That already puts you above $60 a ton. And so when we start talking about longer term targets for cost assessments, I think the, the point that the other panelists have made that this is an expensive thing that nonetheless creates a capability that we don't have otherwise is really important, but this is not a substitute for mitigation. It's probably always going to be expensive. And I think when people talk about cost declines, a lot of the time there's sort of an expectation that this might look like solar or wind where you come like an order of magnitude down in costs maybe, but there is also this kind of baseline energy intensity that means that there are always going to be some operational costs in addition to the non-energy ones too. So you could, so what you're saying is that even if you can get electricity as cheap as three cents a kilowatt hour, you're still talking over sixty dollars a ton of CO two uh, per metric ton of CO two. Yeah, and then if your electricity prices, so the only time you're going to get some electricity that cheap probably is if you're dealing perhaps with a uh, a wind farm where you know intermittent production of electricity and you're feeding that directly into uh, direct air capture. Are there discussions about uh, situating a wind farm, a dedicated wind farm, not to put electricity on the grid, but just to support air capture? Do they, is, is that part of some of the discussions that are going on now? Or can you run a direct air capture system intermittently, sort of at the, at the same, um, you know, the, your thoughts on that or, or others? I think there are, I'll let other people talk in a second, but just to take this on quickly, I think there are a lot of discussions about that. And I'm a life cycle assessment person, so I will just say one of the real challenges with that is that even if you are building a brand new wind farm just to power direct air capture, if you're still in a situation where you would have otherwise built that wind farm for something else, and this is a real problem because we have manufacturing limitations, all that sort of thing, it's not totally clear that you get to just say, because I own this wind farm, I have nothing to do with the emissions that are on the rest of the system. So basically, if you're as a country capable of building one wind farm a year, and a direct air capture plant builds that wind farm and the rest of the economy is still using a coal plant, it's not super clear that you're really using the wind farm. So I think that there's still a lot of questions about just technical capacity. People usually talk about the idea that you, in order to use up the very high capital investments that you're putting into these direct air capture facilities, you probably want to be running them 24 seven. Um, right. That's not necessarily a technical limitation so much as a cost limitation, but I think it is important to recognize that just because you built a wind farm doesn't mean that you're not still kind of uh, contributing to other emissions on the system. Great, thank you. Um, Donald, maybe I can ask, go to you. You're working with a company that actually makes uh, direct air capture systems. So what? where does electricity fit with the cost of of capital, the cost of building the wind farm, 
and the cost of uh, perhaps operating the farm. So, so we've got different components of the cost of CO2 capture. And what I'd ask is, what is the total cost in, say, US dollars per metric ton of CO2 for uh, for wind farm production, uh, for, for a direct air capture, I'm sorry, for direct air capture? Uh, and uh, what are the component costs? Can you give us a sense of where they are now and where do you hope they will be when you get to the scale that you're talking about, the, the gigatons uh, per year? Yeah, absolutely. So our the facility behind me, our Orca facility, and the facility that we're bringing online next year, uh, Mammoth, both of those are run on geothermal energy uh, in Iceland. And so that uh, that allows us to basically keep our electricity costs um, as, as, low as, as low as possible. Uh, and so in terms of our, our overall costs, you know, you can go on our website and, and purchase uh, carbon dioxide removal, you know, directly from us at an individual scale. And that uh, that price per ton runs right about $1,200 a ton. Now, when we look at uh, our, our our corporate offtake agreements, our long-term agreements, um, some some examples are like with Swiss Re and uh, JP Morgan, uh, those, those are in the triple digits. Uh, but they are high. And we uh, one of the things, one of the contexts around when we talk about carbon dioxide removal, uh, I hear the number $100 a ton thrown out a lot. And uh, and I don't think that that number is is realistic. And, uh, and I don't think that's realistic for a couple of reasons. Uh, I think Emily did a, a great job explaining like, yeah, there's there's a fundamental electricity cost here. Uh, and that uh, and that's that's going to that's going to be there, right? And so that that baseline energy load is is an important part of our cost. So while we expect prices to drop as we gain economies of scale and efficiency in our technology, uh, we do we do see a market pressure on these on these prices, right? So right now everybody wants it to come to come down because there's been an artificially low set of of pricing in terms of carbon offsets and, and carbon removals. And uh, I, I say artificially low because you know these things have been uh, dollars a, a ton, and uh, and we've seen the 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 outcome of that where a, a lot of companies have kind of ended up with egg on their face because they're they they end up in the news because those credits really weren't worth anything. And uh, and so, what I anticipate is that there will be an upward pressure on on quality uh, CDR, quality carbon dioxide removal, uh, going forward. Um, a BCG put out a great uh, a great report showing that if we look at just the announced demand for carbon dioxide removal uh, compared to the announced supply by 2030. Um, the announced demand is 1.3 gigatons. The announced removal will be 0.3 gigatons. So it's a gigaton supply gap. Um, and if we're thinking about this in terms of a commodity, uh, then that would, in any commodities market, that differential between supply and demand would send prices soaring. So I, I think it's a it's 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 twofold, right? And it's like where we will we will be able to drop our prices. Uh, we know that that's going to happen as we uh, as we get better uh, and more efficient in the way that. We we capture uh, the CO two, but uh, but there's also going to be an upward price on that as well. So uh, so I, I think that as we're thinking through this and how we're thinking about the the, the cost, that's going to be that's going to be pretty fundamental. And I will say, in terms of energy, like how Climeworks is thinking about this, well, our our next facility that we look to build will be in Louisiana as a part of the direct air capture hub uh, created by the Biden administration through the IRA. And for that facility, we look to provide uh, the electricity via solar panels. Uh, and so we're, we're looking to build a, a solar array that will cover 120% of our energy use. Um, so we will actually be able to add additional renewable energy to the grid. However, to the point of intermittency, that is important because for us, we need to run 24-7. Um, that's a, that's how we how we make that's a, that's you know if the less we run the more expensive it gets right so uh, so we we need to run that and uh, and so that means we will be tied into the grid and so yeah we'll we'll be putting 120 percent of our energy use onto the grid through clean energy but when we're running our facilities at 2 a.m we're going to be tied into fossil fuel infrastructure and that's a, that's really important and something that we account for in our in our emissions and in our net emissions uh, because we really want to be very diligent in saying that this the co2 that we're selling the co2 removal that we're selling really truly is uh, a ton of removal and so that's that's very important to us but uh, yeah these are really really important things and really important topics that we I'm glad we're talking about great maybe one uh, just a follow up question when you talk about the cost, and you're talking hundreds of dollars per ton of CO2 eventually, and it's maybe more than that now even, 
Um, does that include the cost of CO2 compression in geological storage or in what you do with the CO2? And could you maybe comment on what's, you know, what would that cost be or what component of that cost, the actual uh, permanent sequestration? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the the permanency cost is built into that cost. Um, so we we don't sell just direct air capture. Um, that it, it includes the, the permanent storage, um, and uh, the 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 real the cost drivers for us are are capex um, to to build these plants is is expensive. And then there's also the the operational cost as well. So um, you know it would be great to say okay, well it just costs us a ton to to get everything up and running, and then after that it's pennies on the dollar. But that's not true either. Um, so really, you know, there are that these are all these are all cost drivers. The storage aspect is actually not one of the larger drivers of cost. Um, we, we partner with Carbfix uh, for our uh, for our storage in Iceland, and we're looking at, at other opportunities to partner with uh, with storage folks in in the Gulf Coast. But uh, the, the the storage itself um, is 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 fairly straightforward and uh, and is actually not one of our primary cost drivers. Well, that's useful to know. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Sylvan, you've you've been looking at not only direct air capture, but other uh, carbon removal technologies. Um, it was a comment before that this is one of the more expensive one. How much more expensive? And, you know, and what do you see if of the, uh, you know, what is the relative cost to the other uh, air CO2 removal technologies uh, that are on the table now for uh, negative emissions? I mean, if if you want to say how much more expensive, it, you you basically need to reference a certain data point. And I think Climeworks right now is operating the biggest plant on the planet, so we just have to take Donald's word for it. And basically, with respect <laughs> to how much direct air capture costs right now, so he put it at twelve hundred dollars. So I I assume that's just where where we're starting with them. Um, um, I think the the most important thing to flag is also the intermittency point that was raised before. Um, just just neglecting um all the technical difficulties if you would run want to run a, a plant um um on electric um intermittent electricity and just assuming you're running the full plant with electricity you also have to think about the fact that you're trying to amortize the, um the capex cost that you have to put up front so if if you can't operate a direct air pl capture plant 24 7 as Donald said you're gonna have a big problem because th then you're you're um the cost of of a ton is not going to be twelve hundred dollars, but basically way higher than twelve hundred dollars. I think that's just the most important thing to flag on intermittency. And um, I also want to quickly say something about future costs. I think because a lot of future costs are basically put out there. Don't mention the the hundred ton. I think it's just important to acknowledge right now. Nobody can really tell you where costs for direct air capture are going to go. The only thing that we know it's pretty much going to be more expensive. Than most people think. Um, at RMI, we just recently published um, a direct air capture know, um, roadmap in collaboration with Harriet Watt University. And we kind of like analyzed all existing publicly available cost data on any um, direct air capture solutions. Um, and what, what we're seeing is that um, costs are very high. They're going to stay high in the future. And realistically, they might get down to about $250 per ton, maybe $300 per ton. Um, I'm not saying it's it's going to be impossible um, to get below that, but all I'm saying is you're going to have my long life, my lifelong admiration if you manage to do so, um, because it's certainly, it's certainly challenging. Now, how that compares to other CDR solutions? So um, I think you've been talking about biogenic solutions before, planting tree, bets, enhanced ocean weathering. So um, planting trees, you can certainly do below $100 per ton. So if, if you just compare it to planting trees, you're going to be at least a magnitude cheaper. However, there you have the permanence problem, right? You can have a wildfire. If, you're, if, you're, um, if your forest is getting wiped out, um, the carbon is going to be released into the atmosphere again. Um, I think the only way I would comment that is just that's bad. That's really bad, right? So that's <laughs> yeah. the reason That's yeah. the reason why... Um, why the permanence is, is very important. And um, I think if, if you take, for example, enhanced rock weathering, um, this is certainly going to be cheaper than direct air capture too. There we don't really know what it's going to be costing in the future as well, but I think right now it might be a factor three, four cheaper um, than direct air capture. But you don't you haven't really tried it at scale yet, so you don't really know what the ecosystem impacts are going to be. And there another point is very, very important. Um, 
um, that um, Donald mentioned earlier on, um, direct air capture is uniquely via, um, verifiable and also controllable. If anything goes wrong, you switch off the plan. Obviously, then you're not going to produce carbon credits anymore, but at least you don't have a further ecosystem impact. So that's really good. On the other hand, you basically know exactly how much CO2 you're in the end producing. And um, I'm just um, referencing it to enhanced um, um, enhanced weathering. There you, don't, you have still a lot of uncertainty around how MRV is going to be um, produced. Um, if I just compare it to the last thing you've been specifically mentioning, BECs, um, direct air capture is certainly on, on the more expensive side as well. Maybe factor two or three more expensive right now. But um, with respect to BECs, you're going to have a um, scalability problem when you think about biomass supply. And right, right now, everyone life, lo and loves biomass, biomass wastes. Everyone yeah. wants to use biomass waste for a lot of things apart from um, CDR. So you're going to have a competition competition around basically biomass waste. So you have a scalability problem. So I think the most important thing to flag is direct air capture might be the most important solution that we have. It might remain the most important solution that we'll have in the future, but it's certainly going to be um, um, uniquely verifiable. Um, it's going to be uniquely controllable. Um, and therefore, we will pr pretty much need it no matter what in our solution portfolio, even if it doesn't get us um, to prices as, as other biogenic or geochemical um, CDR solutions. Excellent. Well, thank you. Um, Emily or Donald, any other thoughts on that in terms of pros and cons? I think we talked about it. Is we missed anything? No, nope. covered that. Maybe what I could ask is, okay, we've talked about bills. Maybe uh, who should be paying for this? How do we actually, you know, get the money for this? Um, any thoughts, Emily? Do you have any thoughts on that about how how, uh, how the how the society should be paying for this? this? These are these are large bills. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that this is largely where I kind of come in on governance opinions about this. We actually have a paper coming up probably in the next few weeks, kind of proposing Ooh. some different governance things. So maybe I'll send that to you, Dave, when it comes. Comes Please, out. yeah, I love. Um, yeah. I think one of the things that I keep coming back to is if we run this in a market context, in a voluntary market context, where people are basically choosing what they're buying CDR for. And I'll admit, like I've been a Climeworks purchaser for three and a half years or something like that. I think I signed up at the first <laughs> issue, um, but that fundamentally means that I get to decide which emissions are the ones that should be offset. And that means that we end up in a situation where we're making probably much, much bigger claims on this limited CDR resource. And so my opinion essentially here is that without having some sort of public sector approach to this more than kind of a, a general market structure, for-profit structure where people are buying and selling based on their demands, you end up in a situation where the things that really need to be offset, which are the ones that nobody's really that willing to pay for because they're usually in much poorer context, things like this, or drawdown, those don't get done. And the things that are, you know, me offsetting my flight or whatever do tend to get done instead of really focusing on mitigation there. And so my general take is that this needs to be a public sector that's really treated as a waste management industry and funded through properly taxes. That's something that I think we also probably need to acknowledge at this point is that most of the CDR activity that's going on to date is either purely voluntary or very, very heavily publicly funded, in some cases both. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think what we're seeing, especially in the United States, is a huge amount of public funding going to these things without a lot of public control. And really thinking carefully about how much CDR we need, how much DAC we need, specifically in a context of kind of assuming that people are going to be paying for this collectively because it is such a big problem, I think really prompts the question of how do we make sure that we're actually devoting this scarce resource to the things that we need it for, as opposed to the things that are sort of randomly coming out of various actors purchasing it. That's a really hard thing to do. And I think the fact that that's sort of the governance structure that we've started to settle into puts direct air capture companies into really, really difficult places. Like Don was talking a little bit about Climeworks really trying to make sure that their energy inputs are clean. And like, that's pretty much all you can do as a company right now. But the problems of having the overall system not transitioning remain a, a pretty big issue. So I think this needs to be a public sector. Right. Other thoughts on, on that topic or anybody else want to wade into uh, who's going to pay for it? Donald? 
Uh, sure. Yeah. So I am a huge proponent of 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 a carbon tax. Uh, I think that a a well structured carbon price, uh, that a steadily rising carbon price that is uh, implemented upstream with a revenue return back to individuals, um, basically a uh, a revenue neutral carbon tax, I think is is a fantastic policy decision, um, but uh, has has uh, been been challenging to implement. Uh, in terms of you know who should pay for this. You know we're we're all bearing the costs of climate change, and we've all not paid our share of CO two being emitted. Um, you know, right now from Climeworks's perspective, you know we're engaging with uh, uh, with with companies across the board who want to hit their their net zero targets or address their their emission reductions. Um, we would also love to work with the the public sector uh, and and governments who want to do the same. Uh, really, you know, I think from from our standpoint. Uh, However, however we want to do it, whether it's through uh, through direct taxation, through direct government purchases, through uh, through market purchases, through um, incentivizations or, or or subsidies, all of these are on the table for us. Um, you know, my personally, you know, the 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 goal is to get as much CO two out of the air as possible. So, however that that funding materializes, fabulous. Thank you, Sylvan. Yeah, I think. I would have something to add as well. When when people ask me who should pay for that, I usually have a very, very short answer. It's you. And I don't mean specifically <laughs> you, but I mean you, me, Donald, Emily, everyone sitting on, on this call because the scale of the problem is just so massive, right? It's it's This isn't really a question of who is going to pay for a million bucks that we can pretty much find in every place. This is a this is a, a question of who, um, who is going to pay for billions, maybe even trillions of dollars. And I think that's so, something that we can only um, that we can only put up as a society in general. Now, more specifically, I, I like to say you because I usually talk to people who just like me are living in, in de developed economies. So so we we have a privilege, but also a responsibility because we're part of societies that have is historically emitted way more um, than the global south. So um, when I say you, I usually imply that. Um, advanced economies will, should basically be paying, the global north should be paying. Um, and in the end, I also have to acknowledge it's not so much a normative question. It's, it's not only a question of who should be paying, but also who actually has the economic means um, to pay for, for these problems. And that's when we're getting into the question of what is going to be financed for taxes, is basically, is the polluter paying? paying it, it, is it basically, is it a tax incentive? It, are you just basically being forced? But in the end, I think that the main point is um, the voluntary market is probably not going to be big enough for the size of the problem, at least not where it stands right now. So there's right now a transatlantic divide when we talk about CEDR um, between Europe and the US. In the US, um, it's basically all about um, the voluntary market right now, or um, basically just incentives, where, whereas the Europeans, they, they, they focus more on a, on a compliance-based system. I think where this is going to head, um, the voluntary market, this is all great, but it's not going to be big enough. So I think um, in, in the end game, this will have to be integrated to a certain degree into a compliance market. Right. So let I mean, we've talked a lot about resource availability. And one of the key resource uh, issues is you need geological storage space. That doesn't exist everywhere on the planet. There's regions that have it and regions that don't. And there's a question, I guess, in terms of um, do we have, how much do we have on a global scale? Is there how much geological, I mean, uh, Donald, you talked about about a gigaton uh, per year being done by 2050 by Climeworks alone, which is uh, how much, uh, yeah, is, there, is there enough space for that? And how many gigatons per year could we put in for, say, 100 years? And, you know, as, as we transition our, our energy system. What is the geological storage base that we have? Do you have any idea? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So we we actually have, uh, if we if we think about the the total amount of CO two we've emitted uh, globally since the start of the industrial revolution, we have eight times that storage capacity globally. So the the storage capacity is is significant. And for for us at Climeworks, we what we want to do is co-locate where that geologic storage is. And that's where it gets a little tricky is it, because we need we basically need two things. We need uh, a geologic storage and we need clean energy. And in Iceland, they exist right next to each other, which is fantastic. But not every place is Iceland. 
And so, you know, how do we how do we do that? And so we're looking we're looking all over the globe uh, to to do this. So in in the United States, in Canada, uh, in in other places in Europe, we've signed a memorandum of understanding with Kenya uh, to to use the the geology in the Great Rift Valley as a for plants in our 20 in the 2030s. So we're we're really taking this from a global approach. And you know, where can we find that 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 clean, cheap, renewable energy and the geologic storage that matches it? So from a from a from a large perspective, it's all there. We can definitely get the the CO2 out of the air and store it underground. Um, but uh, you know, how how do we do it and how much of a barrier will that be? Um, right now, not very much. As we get into the 2040s, 50s, 60s, it, it could become a greater barrier. But uh, but we don't see that as a as as an as a uh, it's not a limiting factor where we are right now or within the the, the foreseeable scalable future. Okay, so I want to get to the questions from the audience. Um, maybe one last question. Let's talk about unintended consequences. We talked about some of the impacts on land use, uh, impacts on water. Is there water uh, concerns? Um, I mean, when you're actually injecting CO2 into the ground, do you get seismic problems? Or if you're pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere, is there a, a downwind, if you like, a depletion of CO2 that could affect agricultural productivity? Those kinds of questions. Um, Sylvain, do you want to want to start maybe and just what what are the ones maybe just uh, out of unintended consequences of this or other things that we need to be watching for? Yes, sure. I, I think I'm just going to talk about land use and water use because I'm um, not an expert on seismic activities at all. So I just I'm just going to stick to to what I know. And okay. I think the the most important thing um, to realize is that direct air capture is not a is not a single technology. It's a portfolio um, of technologies that we can deploy. And if you want to mitigate or minimize unintended consequences, you basically have to play it like a portfolio so that you use the specific technologies in a place where they hurt least or where they actually cause um, benefits and, and, and not problems. So if we, I want to give you a couple of practical examples for what I mean. So if, if, we, if we take a dry hot area and you're deploying um, a technology using a liquid solvent, for example, as carbon engineering is using, then you might need about five tons of water at the same time when trying to capture one ton of, of CO2. So that's massive. That's going to have an impact on, on basically the, the, water, the water being used in that region. So in this specific area, you might not want to go with that technology. But um, one, one thing that you could do if you're in a hot and dry area, you could, you could go with humidity swing where you actually need very dry circumstances to start with. Um, you're not you're not going to um, um, evaporate as much water. You're actually just going to right. use the water to regenerate the CO two. So that's basically what 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 smart deployment means. Basically, use the technology in a specific geography that is suited for this. Um, I think another one is for for land use. If 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 land use is a real problem in an area that you are. You might not want to go with passive contacting. For people that not, don't know what passive contacting is, it's basically you're not using fans to basically blow in um, the air into your facility, but if you're just letting it flow in um, by natural means, for example, with um, by wind, that uses way more land area. Also, if if you're if you're um, having mineralization, I, I, as heirloom is doing that, um, then you're going to need more, more land um, than for um, than Climeworks is doing in a specific facility. So if you're in, a, in such a situation, you might not want to go with passive contacting, but go with active contacting instead. So it's 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 literally all about trade-offs when deploying this solution. And I think there's not going to be a silver bullet. So um, we should be starting to think about a portfolio of DAC solutions that is going to be across the globe in, in geographic areas where that makes sense. Maybe a, a quick question for um, for anybody on the panel is that we've talked about land use concerns. Okay, in a year of running a, a direct air capture unit for a year, how many tons of CO2 per hectare or per acre, whatever you want to unit you like, how many tons of CO2 per hectare of land so do you think you can measure? What What is the land area per ton of CO2 that we're talking about removing? Anybody got a number on that? Mm -hmm. I should have that number. 
Uh, <laughs> I think um, so. I, I I'm I'm not sure the size of the the orca plant. I'm not sure how how large that footprint is. I think it's about I think it's about a hectare, maybe maybe a little more. Um, and it has the anomalous capacity of four thousand tons. So uh, so the, the 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 capture per land area is 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 quite high. Right. And, and we'll be even. Number, okay. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say it'll be even higher for mammoth because with orca we're only two we stack two with uh, mammoth we're able to stack three units so our our density increases. Okay. All right. Excellent. Um, any other comments that people want to make? I'm going to go to the list of questions. So I haven't had I'll a chance. One to... quick one on oh, the end. Please, end if I can. Yeah. Just to kind of take this back to governance too, because I don't think we've talked about it as much. I think one of the big unintended consequences potentially of DAC development as we see it coming through is that if you do end up in a situation where you're putting in a DAC plant and that is essentially being used to offset emissions that people don't expect, then you can actually lose a lot of public trust very quickly. And I don't know that we've seen this yet necessarily, but I think a lot of the time when advocates go around trying to explain to the public what direct air capture is actually capable, we usually talk about it as this is something that we need to get rid of the hardest to abate emissions, or this is something that we need to actually restore the climate. Like this is the negative emissions point. We can actually make climate change less bad if we can take CO2 out of the atmosphere. And that's how a lot of people get kind of convinced that this is a useful thing to be doing in situations where then the first or second plant that get built are running on natural gas and being used to offset emissions from an oil company or something along those lines, which is sort of where we're going in the US. There's a lot of breach of trust that I think we haven't necessarily grappled with that much, but people are sort of like, wait, you told me that we were restoring the climate and now this company is saying that they're selling net zero oil. And I said that you could put this near me, I would handle a pipeline. I was willing to make the sacrifice to do this thing that I really believed in. And so I think from a governance perspective, we also need to be really careful about unintentional consequences of demonstrating technologies, which yeah, like most of these are still so early stage that we really need to be checking whether it works, but we're making promises to people that are not necessarily being fulfilled by the things that they can see. Um, and I think that that is something that's kind of risky and maybe a good lesson for other countries as they start thinking about how to do this. Excellent, okay. So I'm gonna go back, add, please go go ahead. Can I just add a quick comment? I think just adding on what Emily said, it's just the, the, the importance of community engagement cannot be underestimated. And um, it's, it's basically, if we talk about direct air capture technology, we sometimes just take the system le level perspective and just ask where would it be good to, to basically place um, these direct air capture facilities. But I think it's very important to also ask these people that are living in these areas whether they want to have these direct air capture facilities. And, uh, and, and beyond asking, it's also um, very important to make sure that they're going to have tangible benefits from that, especially because exactly these communities that you, you might that you might be targeting might already have suffered from 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 other technologies. Especially if you're gonna um, if you're gonna put it in the same places that you had oil and gas before, you just want to make sure that that um, that you place direct air capture technologies in 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 areas where people want to have. Right. Yeah. That's I, I think that's so important. And one of the things that's very, one of the things that we're doing at Climeworks is specifically in Louisiana, you know, where, where this DAC hub is going to be is, is basically the, the communities have been impacted just very, very negatively by the petrochemical industry. Uh, there's a lot of mistrust about uh, what direct air capture is and what it, what the risks are around it. Uh, when we think about, um, the CO2 leak that happened a couple of years ago down in Mississippi sickened a lot of people, uh, and uh, and so there's there's fear around this, and that's there and that's reasonable, and so you know for our responsibility as a company is to ensure that we are doing that community outreach and we're doing that right now to to help build trust in the community, help them understand you know what what our technology is, what the risks are around it and and why it's beneficial for the community and and not just from jobs right and it's like okay yes we're going to create jobs fantastic but what else are we going to do because these are the, these are historically disinvested communities and and that's something that we have to address uh, that we have a moral obligation to address all right excellent i want to jump to the questions from the uh from the audience and uh, we'll get as many of these answered as we can some of them i think we've already answered we'll try to skip by a 
I haven't had a chance to read it. Oh, I'm going to jump to the first one here that I have is when Climework talks about economies of scale, are you referring to building modules that can capture a higher amount of CO2 per module? Or are you talking about building more modules with the same capture capacity? You're talking about going from two levels to three. Are you going to go to four to five in the future? Or is it just bigger land area? Uh, how, how do you, what's the plan? Yeah, that's a great question. So it is it is more efficient on the same space. So uh, so we we are stacking higher with with these uh, facilities, and then our next generation of of capture units are are actually designed entirely differently. Um, so we're we're thinking about how that's going to be deployed, and we're looking to deploy those uh, probably in 2026, 2027. Um, and so the the economies of scale is is the the overall uh, capturability. It's our engineering, uh, how we're designing our plants uh, to to be more efficient. It's how we're designing our sorbents, uh, so our sorbents can operate in different uh, different types of weather, uh, because that 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 actually matters quite a bit. Um, one of the things like uh, one of the things that has been really good about the way Climeworks has done this, where we started with 400 tons of capture and then went to 4,000 and now we're going to 40,000, is each step along the way we're learning like, okay, you know, it's like we can make this more efficient, we can make this better. And then we're also learning like what worked great in the lab sometimes doesn't work so great in the field. Um, one of the unintended uh, impacts is the, the impact of uh, particulate matter and specifically NOx and SOx um, degrade our sorbent. Uh, and that, that degradation in our first round was significantly higher than we anticipated. And so we had to go back and, and rethink how we were designing our sorbents to, to, to account for that. Um, so the, the kind of all these little things that we learn along the way um, uh, help us, you know, ultimately drive that cost down. Okay, thank you. We have another question here from, um, how do you project the future of the Canadian land use and cover emissions? And I guess this is a question, and presumably, and maybe Emily, you've done life cycle analysis of this. Do you actually in, take out the um, carbon removal potential of the land that you put the air capture systems on? Uh, is that done in the calculations of of the uh, of the overall impact on CO two? You subtract off what would have you know this could have been a land area that was maybe uh, sequestering carbon, or you know I guess that's is that incorp incorporated in your life cycle assessments. Yeah, hypothetically. And I haven't done LCA for Canada specifically or right. for um, for CDR in Canada, but I think generally we do try to think about counterfactuals. And so in a really high quality one, probably yes, that would be included. My guess is that like we were talking about before, direct air capture itself is actually pretty small footprint, even when you account for a lot of the land that needs to be used for like uh, power production or other resource extraction, and then some of the pipeline infrastructure and things like that, you're not really blocking that much land. So I would suspect that this is probably a really, really small impact of uh, the land that's already actually doing some removal. That becomes a lot more relevant when you start talking about biomass, though, just because a lot of the kind of biomass to removal, like bikers kinds of things, do tend to engage a lot more land than direct air capture. So right. I can't speak specifically for Canada, but yeah, a good LCA would account for that. And I would suspect most of them would probably conclude it's not a huge issue. Okay, excellent. And I think certainly at 4,000 tons per hectare uh, and higher, um, that's going to be a lot more than what you'd pull from biological systems. So um, maybe uh, there's there's a question here about storage capex. Uh, it can be a larger component if pipelines need to be long and permitting and, and NIMBY rights of way needed to be dealt with. Um, you're, I mean, maybe some comments just about the cost of carbon uh, pipelines and geological storage, you know, was by the sounds of it, Donald, you were suggesting it was actually relatively small cost in terms of the overall uh, direct air capture of the whole value chain. So uh, others, any more comments on that? Yeah, the, the important thing for us is the co-location. Uh, we don't want to be piping CO2. Uh, that's that's really not what we want to be doing because it's it's an increased cost and it's an increased risk. Um, and so when we're looking at the, the facility in Louisiana, we're going to be piping that CO2 about nine kilometers from where we're actually capturing it uh, from our storage facility. So that you know nine kilometers is is reasonable. Uh, we were looking at another study in um, another potential site in Indiana where we would have had to uh, pipe over over 100 miles. And so we turned down that that study. Um, uh, we did not engage in that feed study because we didn't want to uh, be responsible for that that length of, of, of pipeline. And so, um, you know, I, right now, given the, you know, kind of where we are as a, as a company, we can we can certainly be that 
be that picky. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I hope that we can keep that, uh, you know, keep that. I'd love for us to never have to pipe up uh, CO2 further than 10 kilometers. Uh, whether or not that's ultimately true, I don't know. But that's certainly our goal. Right. There's a, there's a question here about whether, about using uh, DAC or direct air capture for carbon capture and utilization. So is there anybody doing this today where they're actually doing air capture and then converting it into fuels or into uh, maybe embedding it in cement or doing some other utilization with the CO2? Is there anybody doing that or is that considered economically or viable? So Ben, do you have? Yeah, I think the, the short answer is yes. And I, I think Donald Donald is is basically smiling because they they have been doing that too. I mean, um, Climeworks. I think they started off um, basically using it in beverages. Um, you had wow. different pilots, so um, so Donald is certainly familiar with that too. But I think the bigger context of doing that is just um, acknowledging that right now in the world we have more than a um, hundred megatons. Um, demand for, for CO2 for utilization. And that doesn't take into account enhanced soil recovery, which I'm just not going to count here because um, in the context of, of climate, that's just that's just a terrible idea, right? right. But um but I'm um, just taking that out, you you um our our um industries need, need more than hundred megatons of CO2. Now if you think um about the big pictures and we're just talking here about basically the typical case where you take um CO2 out of the air with DAC and you just store it on the ground. This is great. This is going to create you carbon credits. But if you take into consideration that um, in this on the same planet that we're trying to protect, also people actually need to produce CO2 um, in, in means that are not necessarily great for the environment, you basically need to ask, so, um, ask yourself, shouldn't we basically be using the first 100 megatons that we're using or that we're producing with direct air capture in the end game for utilization? I think that's that's where this interesting thought even comes from because it would make sense. It wouldn't necessarily produce carbon credit. It wouldn't be CDR. It would just basically be um, emissions reduction because you can't yeah, produce- Replacing carbon. another source. Right, right. And, and then the practical, I think practically, um, the reason why some people are doing that right now is that way you basically put um, um, a price, um, you get a you get um you get dollars for your CO2. Um, right. If you're storing it, it only costs you CO2. If you're selling it, you get CO2 from it. If your sure. solution is right now way too costly, um, getting dollars for your CO2 is a great thing. And um, I think that's the reason why um, a, a lot of Direct air, comp direct air capture companies are, are basically doing first pilots with utilization. I think the bigger reason also is just because um, using just a few kilotons of, of CO2 and putting that on the ground in a storage reservoir is not viable. That's storage right. is only cheap um, if you can you basically it. pump in massive um, amounts of CO2. Okay, so I want to flip the question around with another question. And somebody's suggesting maybe positioning a DAC system uh, close to an area where there's a large emitting uh, landscape. They're suggesting wetlands or something, or peatlands, or something that maybe where's those large CO2 emissions, or maybe even maybe just downstream from a big uh, oil refinery or something, you know, where you can put a direct air capture and you have a higher CO2, maybe. Is that is that feasible at all? Maybe you could just tell us what. What is the CO2 concentration in the air coming out of a DAC contactor? Um, so if you've got 420 part per million come in, what comes out the other side? Um, yeah, there's, uh, there, there's no, um, because uh, CO2 disperses within the atmosphere very quickly, uh, right. it's, it's almost, you know, it's, it's homogenous. Um, so, uh, the, so there's really no value in, in co-locating. Like our first, our first units, our, our 400 ton facility was co-located with a, uh, a, uh, a waste to energy uh, facility. And so the, these capture units were right next to the, uh, the, the, the smokestacks for the CO2. And the, the CO2 concentration was basically atmospheric levels uh, coming in. Now, okay. directly out of our, of, our, uh, of our fans, like directly coming, if you can measure right out, uh, coming out, sure. that CO2 amount is almost zero um, because we're, we're capturing almost all, all that CO2. In fact, uh, in 99%, 99.5% of the CO2 okay. we're capturing. 
Um, but uh, but there's no there's no real value in terms of of, of co-location um, in terms of the 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 emissions. And because CO2, we only capture CO2. Like we don't we you know this we're not a um, uh, we're not an air cleaner, right? And it's like, we don't do particulates. We don't do nitrous oxides, sulfur dioxides. Like we don't touch any of those things. So anything that comes in from that point goes, comes back out. So, uh, so, you know, and for, for us, you know, I think if, if we're dreaming here, like it would be really cool if we could actually have those, those type of filtrations before the CO2 got to our sorbents, it would make our sorbents sta more stable and add to their life cycle. So there's, there would be value in doing that. Um, and plus, of course, it would, we would get cleaner air, but, uh, but that's, we're, we're not at that stage. That's a, that's a, that's a dream at this point. It's a dream. Okay. There's a, there's another question here with, with uh, well, the likes of uh, frontier have been instrumental in getting the CDR market off the ground. The consensus seems to be that the government will have to either directly procure CDR or create a compliance market to ultimately get to the scale we need for net zero. How do we get there? Any comments on that or thoughts on that? This is basically why I think this needs to be a public sector. Cause like even in the versions of the world where people look at where we're going, there's a lot of public money in this and just figuring out how big it needs to be is a bit more of a planning organization issue than it is just kind of a, a letting it happen kind of issue, especially if there's not a compliance market. So either through regulation or through the development of a public utility or something like that, it's- right. I think most people that look at this carefully assume that there's going to need to be a public role pretty much permanently. So my view is we might as well give some public control to that as well. Okay. And then there's yeah. a on international scale, right? So COP is happening right now. So I think we need to hope that these people who are attending COP right now, they, they don't just enjoy dinner together and basically um, drink champagne. That They actually also get some, some action going um, because um, one country is not going to be enough, right? It's um, you can talk about this in the context of of basically um, um, of advanced economies, but um, if you only do it there, it won't be enough. So I think there there's going to be a, a bigger global agreement needed, and, and I think the first step is basically meeting your emission targets. That's the reason why I'm emission reduction targets. That's the reason why I'm referring to COP, and then CDR should be the next step. Right, right. There, there's a an interesting um, comment. I know we don't have many. We've got about five minutes left. But um, uh, more of a comment than from a question from one of our uh, audience uh, in Quebec. They said they already have a pulp and paper companies that are, are releasing several million tons of biogenic CO two each year in the atmosphere. Uh, they could use CCS right now to generate negative emissions without using more biomass. Uh, yet the government just gave $75 million to a DAC startup. Aren't we missing public funds here, misusing public funds here? What, any, any comments on that? Or, you know, if, if there was uh, other, op I guess this is a, they are not asking for a comment, but I'm, but if anybody had a comment on that, it'd be interesting. You know, there's a, there's obviously a choice of public money here, but for uh, for bio versus DAC, but. I think I have two comments. So obviously, I'm not an expert in this specific sector, but I basically think um, um, retrofitting with CCS is just not as straightforward as people sometimes think. And um, um, so this is hard. And for it to practically work, you basically have to assume that your um, your point capture facility is going to be running 100% of the time, right? It's it's basically um, what Emily was referring to earlier on. Um, um, if, if if you basically um, emit CO2 on the way, um, this is not going to be net negative. So right. um, a lot of these cases might actually not be that easy. In a lot of these cases, it might not be that easy to basically get to net, um, net um, to negative emissions, but just right. to emission reductions. And I think then I'm just going to circle it back to um, where I started, basically saying emission reductions are absolutely key, but we should just not... Um, we should basically not just put emission reduction and CDR into the into yeah. um into the same um basket. And I, I think the second point that I would have is we're gonna need both either way, right? Sure. And we're gonna need time to scale direct air capture. That's that's what, what Donald was referring earlier on. It's and if we already know um that direct air capture 
is going to need it at a gigaton scale by, by 2050. We cannot just wait um, developing the technology. We cannot just basically say, we're just going to bet purely on emission reductions right now, um, because otherwise we're going to have a problem um, um, in 2050. Right. Okay, we already probably have room for time for one more. That's an interesting question. Um, how important are the process conditions on ge geographical location, weather, for example, weather, et cetera? And this is coming from you know, Canada. We have very cold weather here. Does the, the direct air capture technology require certain temperature ranges, et cetera? Or you know, will it work well, say, in the middle of winter in northern Alberta, um, something of that sort? Or, or is it very much climate uh, impacted to the efficiency of the whole process. Thoughts? Probably um, Donald probably the probably the closest to it. Yeah, um, not not being an engineer, uh, I will say that yes, uh, it it does it does matter, right? So we're we're in Iceland, so we're we're operating in very cold temperatures. Uh, in fact, Iceland had one of its coldest winters ever on record, uh, and that impacted our our capture ability. Um, so yes, yeah, so we 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 deal with water, we deal with. Uh, um, you know, being uh, again in Iceland, we deal with salinity uh, in, from you know, being close to the ocean. Um, there's in Louisiana, it's going to be a whole new set of problems. Uh, humidity levels are much, much higher. We have a, a higher, uh, higher ambient temperatures. Um, so yeah, so there are there are different uh, different challenges. And uh, as we look at uh, potentially uh, locating facilities in in Kenya and uh, the Middle East as well, there's th that's a whole new uh, challenge. Um, so. So yes, it does it, it does impact it, um, and then in in several different ways. I wish I could give you like a, a really detailed explanation as to how, but I I just I just don't know. Okay, we only have about two minutes left. I'm going to ask each of you to give the 30 second summary statement of where you think we're at and what you'd like the audience to take home. Emily, can I start with you? Have you got uh, just some thoughts of uh, wrapping up your your thoughts? 30 seconds. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I think we need to figure out how well DAC works and then also figure out what we're going to use it for. But those are the big research tasks right now. So I think thinking about this not as a full scale industry that we're just applying, but really a, an area of exploration is pretty key. Excellent. Thank you. Sylvan, so you're next. I think in just 30 seconds, I would say we're in a decisive decade. This this, dec this decade is here to basically um, do the R&D needed so that we can be sure that direct air capture can contribute to climate change mitigation at significant scale. I think that's one thing I always want to flag. I'm not sure yet personally DAC will contribute in a meaningful way, but this is a decade to make it happen. If we see how other technologies have deployed and scaled um, and how fast it has been going on, we just know that we need to make massive progress um, during this decade. Wonderful. And Dotto, do you get the last word? All right, thanks. Um, you you vote with your dollar, uh, and uh, basically we we need to vote for this technology. Uh, in in order for us to scale, we we need a market for it. And uh, so for for folks that are that are working with your in within your company, um, you set net zero targets. Um, let's let's have a conversation. Let's see how we can uh, uh, how we can help you meet those. Because if uh, if nobody buys it, we're not going to make it. Right. And I'd like to end by thanking the audience and thanking the organizers of this uh, webinar for putting it all together for Paisley and, and others within the Transition Accelerator. And thank all of you for very interesting discussion. And uh, I hope your rest of your day is uh, very positive and good. And we'll see you in the future. Thank you.